Good day, I'm Norman Wabiger. In today's video, I want to have an informal uh, look at some interesting modern developments that are in the direction of the kinds of results we've been thinking about in terms of Archimedes' theorem for the area of a triangle, Brahmagupta's formula for the area of a cyclic quadrilateral, and we're going to look at extensions of that to other cyclic polygons, and then also to volumes of polyhedra in three-dimensional space. So we're going to look at Robin's formulas, we're going to look at something called the Bellows Conjecture, and we're going to be looking at volumes of polyhedra. We're going to meet a lot of interesting uh, formulas. And part of the aim is just to give you an overview, but to get you thinking that the rational point of view is really the right one. And to give you some kind of experience in terms of the kinds of algebraic um, relations that naturally come up in very natural geometrical situations. And I'm going to be mentioning quite a few people uh, today. Robbins, Tartaglia, Euler, Cauchy, Connolly, Sabatov, amongst others as well. Okay, our starting point, I suppose, is really this classical formula for the area of a triangle in the plane. In terms of the three quadrances of the sides, these are not the distances, they are the squares of the distances, or better yet, the distances are the square roots of the quadrances. So this was a reformulation of Heron's formula, restated in purely in terms of rational quantities. That 16 times the square of the area can be expressed as this polynomial relation between the three quadrants, Q1, Q2, and Q3. And this is uh, what we call Archimedes' function of Q1, Q2, and Q3, and it really has its origin in the one-dimensional theorem, the triple quad formula giving us the relationship between the three quadrants formed by three collinear points. That's the case when this actually equals zero. So this is really the starting point, and we're looking at various generalizations of this in various different directions. And then the next development in this direction was Brahmagupta's formula, which we restated and called it the cyclic quadrilateral quadria theorem. It concerns a cyclic quadrilateral, A1, A2, A3, A4, and its various quadrants Q12, Q23, Q34, and Q14. We want to express the area of this cyclic quadrilateral in terms somehow of these four quadrants. So the crucial ingredients in the, the formula is first of all what we call the quadria of the rectangle, which was 16 times the square of the area. That same object that occurred in Archimedes' theorem. And then there was this thing called m, which was the sum of the various q's all squared, minus two times the sum of the squares of those quantities. And p was the quadruple quad formula applied to these four quantities, and that can be expressed efficiently in terms of m, because this was a key ingredient in that. So if you take this quantity m here and you square it, and then subtract 64 times the product of the four q's, then you get the quantity p. And then in terms of these, we can say that here is the cyclic quadrilateral quadria theorem. It's this real quadratic relation that a squared minus 2ma plus p equals zero. And it's a little bit novel because it doesn't give us a formula for a exactly. It's not a equals some expression. It's a quadratic equation that has a in it. And the quadratic aspect really is a reflection of the fact that there is in general two different kinds of quadrilaterals with the same four quadrants. One convex like this and another one non-convex um, in, in a different shape. So this formula is valid for both the convex and the non-convex quadrilaterals and it means that we don't have to distinguish between these different geometrical configurations the algebraic uh, formulation here covers them both. So a very natural question is, what is the analog of Brahmagupta's formula for cyclic pentagons? So if we imagine having five points, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, and the five bars or linkages that connect them, so imagine a rod of a certain length or a certain quadrants, Q1, 2, 
and then another one Q23, Q34, Q45, and then back to Q15. Then that configuration of rods, of course, is very flexible. It forms all kinds of pentagons in the plane. But if we insist that it sits inside a circle, then it's somehow constrained. And uh, though there's still various possible ways of sticking it inside a circle, there's only a finite number of ways of doing that, and uh, that's called a cyclic pentagon. And the natural question is, what is the area of such a thing? Where we use this generalized formula for the area, which is the purely algebraic formula that we've seen, with a lot of two by two determinant kinds of expressions added up. Well, I think the first person to, uh, to seriously investigate this is the great German geometer, August Ferdinand Mobius, also famous for having introduced the Mobius band. And he lived from 1790 to 1868, made important contributions uh, to 19th century geometry. In 1828, he wrote a paper where he realized that, again, this same quantity, A, which was 16 times the square of the area, satisfied a polynomial equation of degree 7 with coefficients which are symmetric functions or polynomials of the quadrances. So he had an argument for the existence of such a polynomial relation, um, but he could not write it down, or maybe he didn't write it down. It was quite onerous, but he certainly knew that there should be some relation like this, but very curiously of degree 7. And it's involving these five quadrants and symmetric functions or symmetric polynomials of these uh, five quantities. It was really a first time, I think, that somebody really made significant progress to this question of the cyclic pentagons area. In 1952, F. Bowman investigated the situation and made some additional uh, discoveries. He knew about Mobius's work and went further. He started to look at uh, other quantities involved in the story. So if we have a cyclic pentagon, then there's also, well, of course, the radius of the circle that contains the polygon. For us, we would rather think in terms of the quadrants of that circle. In other words, the quadrants between the center and any point. Okay, but he was working in the usual real number framework, thinking about the radius of the circle. And he was also interested in the diagonals, so these other segments that join um, two points on the pentagon which are not sort of directly adjacent. And he realized that you could also write down various equations that relate uh, these things also to the quadrances. And something that figured prominently in his work was a famous uh, theorem that goes back to the ancient Greeks, uh, so-called Ptolemy's theorem, that involves all six quadrances of a cyclic quadrilateral. Okay, that appeared in the Mathematical Gazette. But he didn't actually write down the relation satisfied by the area in terms of the quadrances of the sides. So in 1995, David Robbins came up with explicit formulas for the polynomial relations that are involved here in terms of the area. So he gives an explicit formula for this relation. And in order to write it down, I have to tell you just a little bit about the elementary symmetric functions of the five quadrances. So here we have these five numbers, okay? And we can form various symmetric combinations of them. The simplest symmetric combination is just the sum, and that's called sigma 1. That's a symmetric linear combination of these five numbers. Something else that you can do is you can take what's called sigma 2, which is a sum of all possible products between two different Q's. So Q1, 2 times Q2, 3. And then you add Q12 times Q34. And then add Q12 times Q45. And you go through all the various uh, possibilities of choosing two out of the five Qs, taking their product and adding them all up. That's called the second symmetric function. 
And then the third one is the same kind of story where you take all possible three cues, different ones, and multiply them together. And then you add up all those possible products. So for example, Q1, 2, Q2, 3 times Q3, 4, the product of these three. And then the next one might be the product of these three and so on. You go through all possible combinations. So it's five choose three combinations. You add them all up and you get sigma three. To get sigma four, you go through all possible products of four of them. Well, there's only five such possible products because you can multiply these four together by just forgetting about that one, or you can multiply these four together, forgetting about that one, and so on. There's five possibilities. And finally, sigma five is just the product of all five. All right. So these are called the elementary symmetric functions of these five quantities, and they figure prominently in Robin's formulas. In fact, um, Mobius also clearly appreciated that these were going to be very important ingredients in the, in the story. All right, so what was Robin's formula for the quadria of the cyclic pentagon? Well, again, as before, this is 16 times the square of the area. For some reason, this particular combination with the 16 in front of it and the square of the area is somehow the natural kind of quantity that these formulas want to use. All right, so that's called A. And now Robbins defines some various secondary quantities called T2, T3, T4, and T5. And they're expressed in terms of, well, A, the quadria, and also these various uh, symmetric functions of the quadrances of the sides. But they're also then in terms of previous t's. So first we define t2, and then t3 has a t2 involved, and t4 has a t2 squared, and so on. So we define these quantities here, and then here is a relation satisfied by a. Okay, so there's a, t sub 4 cubed, so this thing cubed, plus this, minus 16 that, minus 18, and here there's another a appearing, minus 27a squared, t sub 5 squared, all of that equals zero. This is a degree 7 relation in A. It may not look like it's degree 7, but if you look at this term here, this is t4 all cubed, and t4 has a t2 squared in it, and t2 has an a in it. So this quantity here is quadratic in a. If we cube it, it's degree 6 in A, and multiplying it by another A means that it's degree 7. And that's, in fact, the only uh, degree 7 term, so it's actually a monic relation in terms of uh, A of degree 7. Okay, it's a very remarkable formula, sort of a tour de force, and Robbins obtained it in a rather indirect way through uh, very clever uh, usage of actual explicit examples and writing things down carefully and using a computer to make uh, a whole series of equations and then solving them. So a very indirect um, but interesting approach. In fact, he also gave a similar formula for the quadria of a cyclic hexagon. In fact, it looks somewhat similar. For a heptagon, or a septagon, a seven-sided figure, I'm not sure if, uh, if it's actually known. I know that he was working on it when he, uh, when he passed away um, not uh, too long ago. He also showed that for cyclic n-gons, if we generalize to a, the general case, that there is, in fact, a similar formula. It must exist, but what it was, of course, uh, is, is not so easy to say. And he conjectured that for odd uh, polygons, that the degree uh, should form some, uh, some reasonable pattern here. There was a formula for it. But in fact, this was uh, already known by uh, Mobius uh, and understood by Bowman also earlier. Okay. So, very tantalizing kind of story that there are these formulas out there. They are increasingly complicated degree, they're probably very significantly challenging to write down, 
But with our modern computers, which are very good at dealing with these kinds of expressions, even if there's hundreds or perhaps thousands of terms, you know, our computers can deal with this. So we are sort of in a position where we can start possibly exploring these kinds of very subtle but deep relations. Okay, it's a very deep phenomena here. Okay. And uh, it's, it's very interesting that it really has the same kind of form as the, the Brahmagupta uh, form that, that we wrote down. And it's ultimately all about this um, quadria in terms of the quadrances of the sides. So when we write it this way, it's all a completely rational phenomena. There are no square roots that are necessary. And it's, it's all really algebra. And it's very interesting and deep algebra, in fact. Okay, so now let's move to three dimensions and sort of corresponding kinds of questions for three-dimensional analogs of polygons, which are called polyhedra. Okay, so these are three-dimensional shapes that uh, are made out of a finite number of points. Then you sort of take the convex hull of those finite number of points. Or another way of thinking about them is your things that are obtained by taking polygons rigid planar polygons and putting them together so that any two polygons if they do meet meet along a side or maybe at a vertex all right so this is a very interesting kind of uh, mathematical object uh, we are going to be talking more officially about such things and their volume but let's just suppose for the sake uh, of this discussion that you have an intuitive understanding of what volume means Okay. In fact, it turns out that volume is a, is a very interesting and somewhat delicate uh, thing to pin down. But, so let's just take an informal approach here. Okay, so a natural question is, given a polyhedron, like perhaps this simple one, this is a, called a tetrahedron, has four vertices. What is its volume? What is its volume not in terms of the area of the base and the height. But suppose that we know only the side lengths, or better yet, the side quadrances. Can we figure out just from knowing, say, Q12, Q23, Q34, Q24, Q14, and Q13, or there are six of these quadrances, if we know those six numbers, then we feel that the tetrahedron is determined. So its volume is determined, and there should be some way of expressing that volume in terms of those six numbers. Remarkably, there is such a formula, and it goes back to a very remarkable fellow. His name was Tartaglia, who lived from 1499 to 1557. And his name is usually famous in the context of solving a cubic equation. He was, in fact, the first person to have discovered a formula for solving the cubic. Then there's this famous story of him and his friend slash rival Cardano and, uh, you know, a fight of priority over this formula. But I think he deserves at least as much fame and glory for this remarkable formula for the volume of a tetrahedron in terms of the squared lengths or the quadrances of the sides. Here it is. Okay, so 144 times the square of the volume. Notice it's a little bit like the 16 times square of the area that we were talking about as the quadria of the planar situation. Something similar is happening here. This particular combination turns out to have this big but still beautiful polynomial expression in terms of the Q's. All right, so there's products of three Q's at a time, and there's, uh, I think, about 12 of them. And then we subtract uh, products of Q's associated to a face. So the product of the uh, quadrants is along every face, and there's one, two, uh, three, four of those. And then there's uh, these other six uh, terms involving uh, something like uh, 1, 3, and the opposite one, 2, 4. So this is a, a remarkable uh, a formula that uh, Tartaglia discovered.
And it has, these days, there's other ways of writing it in terms of determinants and uh, various other ways. But uh, this is what it looks like as a polynomial. So it's a very intriguing uh, kind of formula, and it's very interesting to note that it's a polynomial in the square of the side lengths. So in fact, we don't actually need the notion of length or distance to get at this formula. So classical geometers have known for a long time, in fact, that quadrants is in many situations really the natural quantity associated to the separation of two points. Tartaglia knew that. His formula clearly illustrates the importance of quadrants. Tartaglia's formula was rediscovered by Leonard Euler uh, several hundred years later and is often referred to as Euler's result. In fact, in my book, I attributed it also to Euler mistakenly, not knowing that Tartaglia had discovered it earlier. The formula has also been extended in other directions. In the 19th century, Cayley and Menger extended it into higher dimensions uh, using uh, theory of determinants, also a very interesting development. Tartaglia's intriguing formula naturally gives us the question, is there some kind of corresponding formula for other kinds of polyhedra? Tartaglia's formula only works for tetrahedra formed by four points, essentially the simplest kinds of polyhedra. What about more complicated ones? Is there a similar kind of formula that lets us figure out what the volume of such a thing is in terms of the side quadrances? For example, here is, well, that's something that's combinatorially like a cube. It has eight vertices and six quadrilateral faces, but these quadrilateral faces are not necessarily squares. They might be more general quadrilaterals. And if this is the vertex AI and this is the vertex AJ, then here is the quadrants QIJ. And there are then 12 quadrances. Natural question is, if we know those 12 quadrances, is there some way of figuring out what the volume is? Well, if you think about this question, one thing that might occur to you is that there might be a potential problem because if the faces themselves are rigid polygons which are fixed beforehand, just like in that construction uh, set polydron, where you have faces of a very particular kind. So suppose that those are all determined. But if it's possible for us to take two adjacent faces and move them with respect to each other, of course, then the other ones might also move with respect to their neighbors, then it might be possible for us to change the volume without changing any of the faces, and therefore without changing any of the quadrances. If that was possible, then there would be no way of having such a formula for the volume, because the volume wouldn't be determined by the quadrances. Fortunately, there is a lovely theorem due to the great French mathematician Cauchy, 19th century mathematician, who um, did work in many different areas almost single-handedly created what we now call complex analysis. But he also made contributions to geometry, and he showed that a convex polyhedron with fixed faces is rigid. So if the faces themselves are prescribed, their shape and size is already prescribed, then the polyhedron itself is rigid and does not allow any flexing between adjacent faces. That's true if the polyhedron is convex. If you have some experience playing with polydron or something like it, you will have an intuitive feeling for this because when you create one of these polydron uh, polyhedrons, uh, what happens is that at the initial stages, when there's only a few pieces, there's still a lot of give in the various sides because they're only connected along the sides, so there's a lot of flexibility. And as you start approaching closing the thing up, things become less and less flexible. Till by the time you put that last piece in, the whole thing is completely rigid. So that was uh, 
Cauchy's theorem, but there was this caveat that it was only working for convex polyhedron. And I remind you that means informally that if you have any two points, say on the polyhedron, then the line segment joining them is entirely within the polyhedron, doesn't move outside. So then in 1977, an interesting twist occurred. Robert Connolly, an American mathematician, discovered a non-convex flexible polyhedron. He discovered a polyhedron which was not convex, so that if you were looking at its sides, at some point sort of the sides sort of come in and then come back out again, so it's like it has a dent inside it. So it's still a polyhedron made out of flat polygonal faces. But it was such that it actually flexed. You could actually move it. Some of the faces would move with respect to each other, so the whole thing would move. It was very interesting and it intrigued uh, the mathematical community very much. And shortly after his discovery, other people started investigating, came up with simpler examples. So there's an example of uh, Stefan. Uh, it looks uh, something like this. It has uh, not too many uh, sides and you can actually make this out of uh, cardboard and flex it and see that it actually works. So people did that. They made these things out of cardboard and they sat there flexing these things and they noticed something interesting. That when you flexed one of these things, so some parts kind of moved in but at the same time other parts moved out. And as you did this flexing it appeared as if the volumes of these polyhedron were remaining roughly the same. It wasn't the case that they were getting sort of smaller or larger. So they did experiments by poking holes and blowing cigarette smoke or something like this inside one of these things and then seeing what happens as you flex them. So if the volume was going to get smaller then you would expect that as you flexed there would be smoke coming out of the hole, be like a bellows. And they noticed that this didn't happen. The smoke did not come out of the little holes. And it's strongly suggested that perhaps the volumes in fact were being preserved. And this became known as the bellows conjecture. When a flexible polyhedron flexes, its volume stays unchanged. So I think it was uh, Connolly and, and Sullivan that came up with this. A conjecture. Very intriguing. Well, this was um, established eventually in 1995 by I. Sabatov, who deduced it as a consequence of a remarkable formula for a volume of a polyhedron. He basically answered the question that we asked in the previous slides and discovered that in fact there was a polynomial relation satisfied by, well not the volume, but the square of the volume of a polyhedron. If the polyhedron is of a fixed combinatorial type, so we have a polyhedron that's looking perhaps like a cube, maybe a cube with quadrilateral sides instead of square sides, but combinatorially a cube. So if you take one of those fixed combinatorial types, then the volume satisfied a polynomial equation, very much the same kind of equation as Robbins had discovered for the cyclic pentagons and hexagons. So the volume satisfies a polynomial equation whose coefficients are symmetric functions of the side quadrances. Once again, these relations that are occurring are purely expressed in terms of the square of the volume and the quadrances of the sides. So naturally the mathematics here seems to be wanting to express itself rationally. And because Sabatov was able to determine that such a relation exists, he was able to deduce that if you change the position of things but keep the quadrances the same, well then that volume can't change because 
the relation is not changing if the coefficients are symmetric functions of the quadrants, and the quadrants aren't changing. It's a very elegant and powerful way of solving the Bellows conjecture, but also opening up a wide new arena for investigation. Namely, what do these polynomial relations look like? For a tetrahedron, we know it's goes back to Tartaglia. What happens if you take an octahedron, or a cube, or an icosahedron? What kind of relation does the square of the volume satisfy with respect to the quadrants of the sides? Well, Sabatov was only able to work out these uh, relations in very special cases. Um, for example, certain types of octahedra. And so this question is still a very much an open question about what kinds of uh, polynomial relations are we getting here. But we see throughout this story that there's some kind of consistency here that goes back to Archimedes' formula for the area of a triangle uh, through to Robbins and Sabatov's polynomial relations. There's a kind of a consistent story that really is suggesting to us that we should think rationally and algebraically about these kinds of questions. That it's the quadrances and not the distances which are naturally involved. And classical geometers have known this for a long time. But somehow, remarkably, most people have referred to these quadrances not as something separate, deserving its own name, but always in terms of the square of the distance, which is logically weak because it's actually the distances which are problematic. The distances involve the square roots, while the quadrances are purely algebraic. We also learn that worrying about ordering uh, is not really necessary. Uh, the algebra sort of takes care of things. But we also have to be prepared for very big polynomials. Okay, there's serious issues about how do you work with these things. And until a few decades ago, it really was very uh, challenging to, to try to work things out. That's why Mobius had a, had a problem writing down these relations, because he didn't have a computer helping him. If he did, he probably would have been able to write down these relations. And it also suggests that we need to learn a little bit more about uh, symmetric uh, functions which are playing a natural role here and seem to be sort of interesting objects in their own right. So we've touched base on a number of interesting uh, recent developments. I hope you're getting the idea that adopting a rational algebraic point of view can have lots of advantages and can be very natural, at least when it comes to doing certain types of uh, geometry. So the problems that we've been uh, thinking about here uh, deserve to be studied in a little bit more depth, and I will talk about them, uh, at least some of them, in the famous math problem series. In my next video, I want to go back to the Brahmagupta formula, and I want to actually prove it for you in a somewhat novel and powerful way. And to do that, I'm going to introduce something else which is very important, which is a projective view or projective parameterization of conics. So we're going to bring into now the story the projective line. We've been talking a lot about the affine line, measuring there. Now we're going to bring in this other side of geometry and see that it also plays a very important role. And it's going to allow us to um, create some nice formulas and apply them to actually have a completely solid proof of the Brahmagupta formula, which we're calling the cyclic quadrilateral quadria theorem. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.